talking about Hagar and Ishmael and of the son of the maid God says I will make a nation also because he is your descendant throughout scripture we see this God delivers Lot because of his relationship with Abraham David because of him so many kings were spared and Israel was allowed to go on but here he says of Ishmael a nation that would become an enemy nation he says because he is your descendant I will make of him a nation what will God make of you you're aligned attached to someone greater than David someone greater than Abraham is here for the sake of Christ what will God do for you what will the eschaton what will eternity look like ear has not heard eye has not seen this is the great pain of the prophet and the preacher because he knows that he can't even comprehend a tenth part or a hundredth part or far beyond that of the glory that awaits God's people and he knows that even what he can comprehend as meager as it is he can't communicate to God's people if you only knew the greatness of his salvation of what it means to be in Christ oh what a joy unspeakable and full of glory you would possess in ever greater reality you are dearly loved I to the to the anger of my doctor and the concern of my wife I spend too much time running around with people at conferences it's because I'm selfish I love hearing stories his story you know there's people here from all sorts of states all sorts of backgrounds there are people here from different countries and look what he did he gathered you he found you I know of one little boy that used to be so afraid that he would hide out with the pigs and cry it God saw him and found him I know of prostitutes who felt so dirty in some tiny room in a gigantic city wanting to rip out their own heart to peel their own flesh from their body and attempt to be somehow clean found them oh he he's God how many of you could stand up one after another and tell us where he found you in some obscure place where no one could find you he found you Oh, praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise him in the morning, praise him in the night watch. Praise him in life, praise him in death, praise him. There's only one hero in this story, and that hero is Jesus Christ. There are no great men of God, there are no great men of prayer. There are only tiny, weak, faithless men of a great and merciful God who has granted them grace. Please always remember that. Always. Only one hero in this story, Jesus Christ. Jesus is God incarnate. God who became man. But in the becoming of man, he laid aside so much of the privileges, prerogatives of his deity. He truly was a man, and he did what he did as a man in the power of the Holy Spirit. He had to be that last Adam, and as the last Adam, he had to conquer for his people. And he conquered for his people, having come in the body, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not a body that was pre-Adamic fall, 
but a body that, though incorruptible, suffered all the consequences of the fall, the weaknesses, the pain, the suffering, the sorrow that could be tempted. And yet it says that God upheld him. Oftentimes we're afraid to think that way because there are so many attacks upon his deity. But we see that he was a man. And God upheld him, took him by the hand. The Spirit empowered him. You see, we needed, we had a father who fell. Adam, we needed a brother who could conquer who was truly man, and that was Jesus Christ. And so we have to hold that in our minds when we make our way into the Gospels and see his life of prayer. He wasn't just praying because he was spiritual. He wasn't just praying because he wanted to show devotion. He was praying because he needed prayer. He needed prayer because he was to overcome as the last Adam. He was to overcome as flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone, to draw upon nothing but his Father's strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that way he can be our example. He can be our example. Your problem is not, it's never that you're too weak. The problem is that we don't know how weak we are that weakness would drive us to prayer as being truly incarnate for our Savior to pray. I find this very amazing that nowhere do they come to the Lord and say, teach us to cast out demons. They never come to the Lord and said, teach us to preach. They never came to Him and said, teach us to walk on water. But they did one time ask teach us and it was to pray. I have to believe, and the context indicates it, it was because he prayed like no one that had ever heard him pray. No one. No one. Now, if God incarnate, this perfect man, in the economy of our redemption, it was necessary for him to do what he did in the power of the Holy Spirit as a man drawing upon the Father's strength. How much more is it a necessity for us? Let's read our text, Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life, and I will put sinews on you, make your flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, that you may come alive, and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, behold a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. And they came to life and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. My desire is for you to see the absolute impossibility, the absolute impossibility of the salvation of a man, the absolute impossibility of the extension of Christ's kingdom. You see, your problem is never that you recognize some weaknesses. Your problem is that you don't recognize them enough. 
Your problem is that you're not, it's not that you're weak. The problem is that you do not know how weak you are and how great the battle and how impossible the task that has been given to us. And if I could, I would have the Lord grab every minister of Christ by the back of his neck and stick his face in those tombs and do with him what he did here with Ezekiel. Cause him to move about, around about, everywhere, looking and looking, seeing nothing for acre after acre after acre, but dry bone. The first step to spiritual power is recognizing your impotence and the greatness of God. We have a world to win. Do not think that I'm standing up here uh, this evening saying that all this is dark and gloomy and we should circle the wagons and just wait for the second coming. No, we have a world to win. We have nations to save. We have dragons to fight. And it can be done, but it cannot be done in the power of a man. But it can be done in the power of God. I believe that in the regeneration of a soul there is manifested more of the power of God than in the very creation of the universe because he created the universe ex nihilo out of nothing but when he saves a man he recreates a mass of fallen corrupt humanity into something glorious a child of God it can be done the kingdom can and will be extended but not by your power and not by mine, but His. Oh, give me, give me weak men. And the world can be changed. Do you see what kind of battle we're in? You see, sometimes, and I know, I've known even some good theologians who've gone wrong in this area. I mean, when you, when you think, I'm gonna switch for a minute, when you think about hell, it is, it is terrible. To think about. I mean, if you really think about it, and so many theologians have tried to dance around it and explain it away, that it doesn't exist or that man is just annihilated and that's done with. And I think one of the reasons why men have such a trouble with hell is because they have a version of hell that, that's suited more for Dante's Inferno than it is for the scriptures or for media or for even evangelical preaching. We have this idea that there's all these people in hell and they're all sorry for what they did and they all want to run away from their sin and if they just had one more chance to bow before the feet of Christ they would do it that is not the case and I learned that from Romans 1 they have been totally and completely turned over to their own lust and their own evil and if God were to condescend and, and stand in hell and throw open the doors of hell and tell everyone in there, come out. Acknowledge me as God and come out. Oh, they'd run to the door. They would run to the door and they would slam it shut and they would say, we would rather rot in hell than stand in the presence of your righteousness. When we're preaching the gospel, we have to understand there is no power in the eloquence of a man. There's no intellect that is sufficient. A supernatural work of God has to occur, and it occurs when a man lashes himself to the gospel. He preaches the gospel. When you see all the sins that are in Romans chapter 1, do not do what most people do. They see these sins and go, because of these sins, God's judgment is going to come on America. No! If you see these sins, God's judgment has already come on America. That's what you have to understand. Because the sin here, it is not what men do to themselves or what men do to men. The great sin here is although they knew God, they did not want Him. You need to understand something. There is nothing, no one, more precious to God than is His Son. Everything God has ever done, He has done it for His Son. Your salvation was done for His Son. He's gathering a people for His Son. In the mind of God, everything has to do with His Son. So the great sin of America the great sin of Europe, 
centuries of gospel preaching, rejection after rejection after rejection after rejection of the one who is most precious in the eyes of God, his son. Also, are you going to win the day with cultural sensitivity? I think history, I think the last two years proves me right that one day I'll be sitting in prison with a Pentecostal who would not deny that Jesus Christ is Lord while a bunch of fancy tattoo wearing reform boys have already denied Christ and gone on to something else. What are we going to do? Make a truce with culture? Work ourselves to death to try to prove to them we're not as dumb as they think we are? Are we going to be like reeds shaken in the wind? People like that belong in palaces and with politicians. What we need today are prophets. We need men who stand behind a pulpit and not just in a pulpit, on the street and in the jungle who cry out, thus saith the Lord, not because they've received a vision, but because they have the text and they know God. You know, I want to tell you, you know, all those verses in Scripture about preaching with power, never forget, preacher, they were written by a man who wasn't preaching in a beautiful pulpit with everyone saying amen and marveling at his eloquence. Written by a man who was beaten half to death almost every time he preached. Power is not needed for protected men. Power is not needed for safe men. Power is needed when you go out there and throw yourself in the middle of the enemy. We need men who do what? Who are constantly crying out for greater and greater manifestations of the life and power of the Holy Spirit in their own lives and in the church. What was he like? He was called of God. He was led of the Spirit. What was his attitude towards the bones? I think he looked at those bones and he said, that's my people. He wasn't detached. That's my people. What was the prophet's attitude when he saw the bones? Sorrow. But then, let's go back to Ezekiel, verse 3. God said to him, son of man, can these bones live? He said, I answered, O God, O Lord God, you know. I love this. He did not presume upon the grace of God. Yet at the same time, he did not doubt the grace of God or its power. God, if you want them to live, they will live. There's a wonderful thing when everything has to do with God and only God can do it. There's an assurance in that. Is there anywhere in the scripture that says that we can't take the gospel to the nations? Is it anywhere? No. Is there anywhere in the scriptures where it says that there can't be a revival? That nations cannot be turned? No, it doesn't say that. Don't say it does. It doesn't. This is not a time for tiny men with small hearts and tight spirits. This is not a time to watch the news and Instagram and become depressed. Why? If he wants them to live, they'll live. He'll live. And he tells me that he wants a very large people for his son. And it's our job, our task, to go get them. To go get them. Are you happy with your sermon? Because you got all the words right? Because your exegetical work was so careful? Because all these great expositors would have applauded you? Are you content with what you did? If you're content with those things, then step out of the pulpit. Don't ever go back in there again. You're looking for people to be converted. You're looking for saints to be edified. You're not content with your performance. You want to see God move. And you will not be satisfied. You will not be happy. You'll take hold of the horns of the altar and say, give me this thing. Give me souls or I die. You preach as a dying man to dying men. And you preach as though you will never preach again. While oh, preaching. Preaching. It's a dangerous thing. It's dangerous for the man if he preaches wrong. Because he'll stand before God one day and give an answer for every word. But it's dangerous for the congregation if he preaches right because they will stand before God and have
have to give an answer for every word. Preaching is dangerous. We need dangerous men. There's so much power in the gospel. If you lay aside all these trinkets and tools and just preach it raw, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me. He was crying out, crying out for the Spirit of God to do what man cannot do. Man can create a rattling. Man can create noise. Man can build an entire church of 10,000 people. But he can't convert one soul. Oh, brethren, every battle is won in prayer. It's not fighting with sinners or a sinful world that ages you. It's fighting with God. It's the night watch. It's knowing you have nothing. But oh, when He comes, when He comes, the Bible says that fathers are to be the greatest influences in the lives of their sons and daughters in every shape, form, and fashion. But the Bible also says that in church, the people who are to minister to every individual in the church are elders. These are men who meet certain qualifications according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1. They are mature men of God. They're men. Most of you never came in contact with one. You went to Sunday school, you went to children's church, there were no elders. You went to youth group, and it was just a young guy, a little bit older than you, with moose in his hair, great personality, who didn't know anything. Do you see? The main influence in the family is to be the father. That was removed from you. The main influence in the church is to be the elders, and you probably never even saw one. And so what do we have? We have removed everything. Manhood is something that is taught. Manhood is something that is learned by imitation, but they've taken all the men out of your life. Probably for some of you, the most memorable man in your life is your coach, because he was the only one who acted in any way with a masculine authority in your life. And here's the sad thing. You're going to go back to church, and this is just going to continue on, unless some great changes are made. We have lost men in the West. Even the secular authorities now are saying there's no men. That America has no men. It's a crisis. Everything is wrong right now with regard to family, young men, everything. And we've got to change it. If you ask me the question, why do you say that? I say because that's what the Bible says. But if you ask me, well, how do you know the Bible says that? Because everyone else is just happy with what's going on. So what right do you have to say that the Bible contradicts our Western way of the church? Well, I appeal to history. If I appeal to history and I look down through 2,000 years of Christianity and I see that there are, there are theological and doctrinal trends, that this is the way they did things, this is the way they interpreted the Bible, and then I come till today and I recognize that today, the church today, contradicts 2,000 years of Christian history, who's wrong? See, I can appeal to history and say, we're just wrong, we're just wrong. How many of you men are consistently, let's say, four times a week at least, and for a half an hour, hour each time, that you are teaching your children the scriptures. Almost no one would raise their hand. Now that's a bare minimum, and almost no one would raise their hand, and no one would have a problem with it. But if I then stood up and said, and as the new pastor, I am going to cancel youth group, we're no longer going to have youth group, we're no longer going to have Sunday school, we're no longer going to have children's church, what would they do? They fire me. I mean, there would be such a battle going on. They would say, that man hates children, that man hates you. Well, look what we have. Jesus said, you annul the commandments in order to carry out your traditions. Nowhere in Scripture are fathers commanded to turn over the religious education of their children to a church. But all over the Scriptures, fathers are commanded to disciple their own children. 
to disciple their own wives, to pour their lives into their family for the cause of Christ. So we will keep our traditions and we will kill anybody that comes up with Scripture and says you're wrong. You see how easy it is just to be following a tradition and not following the Scriptures. Well, this is the way we've always done it. Yeah, it is in your generation and it's wrong. Also, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good deed. Now, man of God here isn't necessarily someone who preaches. We are all to be men of God. And what it is telling us is that everything we need to be what we're supposed to be is found in the scriptures. And if we're memorizing the Scripture, if we're renewing our mind in the Scripture, then the Scripture will teach us, reprove us, and train us, correct us. But if, if we're out there, just imagine for a moment, someone who is out in the world 16 hours a day, a couple hours a day television, a couple hours a day or an hour a day with video games, he's surrounded by a worldly atmosphere, he goes to classes on a secular campus and everything else, and then he has a 15-minute quiet time. Yeah, you're going to change the world. No, you're not. You're going to be conformed to the world. You're just going to throw a Christian t-shirt on your back. It's going to take a lot, guys, to break free. The big problem NASA has is gravity. It's just a really big problem. You ever do any mountain climbing? The big problem is gravity. And it takes a whole lot of force to break free from that gravity. The same way it takes a whole lot of force to break free from your culture more than just 15 minutes a day have to realize this is wrong. I must also strive to be a biblical example. So as a man, my primary responsibility in my family is to know the Word of God. It is not to give my children everything I didn't have, but it's to give them a father. Joshua 4, 5 and 7, And Joshua said to them, Cross again the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this be a sign among you that when your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? You shall say to them, Because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. What does that mean? You're to be a man of God who fights God's battles. And when you see God do tremendous things in your life and through you, you write them down, you set them down, you remember them, so that when you go to your children, you can say, I saw this. God did this. God delivered me here. God was faithful here. God changed me here. Guys, this is all about God. And this is all about eternity. It's not about your best life now. It's all about Him. Every last bit of it. It's all about Him. Now, Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. He's not commanding this to Sunday school teachers, youth leaders, or anything like that. It's the Father's primary responsibility. My primary responsibility as a man is to know Christ. After that, it's my wife. It's my primary responsibility. After that, it's my children. After that, it's the ministry. And that's the way it goes. It's the way it has to be. Now, you may not be in the ministry, but it's going to have to be the same thing for you. If you think that you have done well because you have provided financially for your family, you have no clue what the Scriptures say. As a matter of fact, guys, this is the way it's going to be if you're going to be biblical. You're going to work and work and work and work. And when you come home at 5 in the afternoon and you're completely wore out, guess what? Your job just began. Then you're going to pour your life into your family until you go to bed at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. You are not going to sit down and watch TV. You're not going to go out with your buddies and do all kinds of things. You are going to pour your life into your wife and your children and you are going to go to bed tired. And you're going to get up again and you're going to do it all over again. This is the Christian life. Not hanging out with your buddies, not doing all this. No, it's that. And it's enough. But then also realize this. A man so dedicated to his family, there'll be a time. Like for me, I love to, to hunt. My wife will just come to me and say, here's your bow, here's your arrows, here's your tree stand. Go out, have a good time, kill something. Because they know he's poured out his life. And she will learn, as you have given your life to bless her, she will learn to give her life to bless you. Instead of 
you fighting for your territory and your free time and she fighting for her territory and her free time, it'll be one of servant, of blessing. My little boys, I remember when Ian was about five years old, and he was like, Daddy, what do you do? And I said, oh, I said, you wouldn't believe me. He said, no, really, what, what do you do? I said, you wouldn't believe me. I told you. He said, no, Daddy, what do you do? I said, I fight dragons. Son, there's a war going on. There is a dragon, and he's worse than anything you could ever imagine. And every day, hundreds of thousands of people are being killed. Every day, nations are crumbling. Every day, families are falling apart. Every day, tens of thousands of children are starving to death. All of it because of this dragon. And I have given my life to fight him.